Hello and welcome to the Southbound Sports Show. I'm your host, Richie Leahy, here with my co-host, Maddie B. We got the, the new camera up, so if you're watching on video and if you, if you download this, uh, you can find the live video Tuesday nights at 9 or so on Facebook Live. Uh, you can like our Facebook page at Southbound Sports. And we also app- upload it to YouTube after. So you can also follow us on YouTube at Southbound Sports. Uh, so make sure you tell your friends about the show. Uh, we're going to get into it today. Have a lot of stuff to talk about, particularly uh, football related and stuff. But let's kick it off with high tempo. What do you got this week for us, Matt? Well, it's kind of a multi prong thing, but uh, with winning my fantasy football game this week now puts me in line for the championship and while i was watching the game that stood out most was the tennessee jacksonville game for a pair of reasons number one having derrick henry on my team and having him go off for 50 points they'll put me in the driver's seat for that for my fantasy win but also the big news was uh tennessee titans are investigating leonard fournette's racial claims and apparently be behind the jacksonville bench um i don't know if you saw this no i didn't i'm completely baffled here so what happened? he was apparently fournette was like attempting to try to fight tennessee titan fans and was claiming that they were calling racial slurs at him and they're looking into it now just to see what exactly was said if someone has any any audio of the racial slurs being said. Um, He definitely, you don't, with the couple clips that I saw when I was looking, trying to find it, um, I didn't, I couldn't audibly hear anything, but I, I thought it was interesting from the perspective that as an NFL player, you have to go in expecting to just be getting trolled by the worst types of people. I mean, as a high school coach, I know that even at the high school level, people like, I can hear negative comments that they throw at me. I could only imagine if I'm getting paid millions of dollars, what what those comments would be like. So, you know, just just kind of hearing and seeing that kind of stuff, um, it, it doesn't surprise me. It doesn't surprise me that the the level of lowness that people will go to. But I was just surprised that that they're investigating and, and doing stuff on the end of looking after the players. I I mean, I understand the issue but like you said you're getting paid to be there getting into altercations with the fan that are paying to be there it should never happen and you can even go to college if you remember a few years ago when marcus smart had that issue at oklahoma state where he said that someone had made some racial slurs at him and he he came he went at him i think it was texas tech he he went into the stands and tried to fight that guy now, those are college athletes, and even in that situation, uh, I mean, it didn't really hurt his, his career or his prospects, but you, you got to think, man, you're under the magnifying glass as it is as an athlete. You don't really, athletes don't really stick around in the NFL. You got to kind of tune that out if you want to pr- basically preserve your career. And I hate to say it, yeah, it's going to be rough, but uh, look what happened whenever. Kaepernick brought those issues on. Now he's in a he said, she said game. And as a player, you definitely don't want to put yourself into that situation. So uh, thanks for bringing that in because I definitely didn't see that. Although I stay away from most of the mainstream media these days. They annoy me. Uh, getting into what well, we can keep that for my high tempo. Uh, keep on to that media thing. A lot of flack has been getting thrown at the new NCAA basketball rankings. And I know we normally don't talk basketball this early in the year, but I wanted to just see if you saw this because I know Florida State's ranked pretty high. But the NCAA got rid of the RPI, which was their power rankings. And they came up with a new computer system. And everybody in the media is going crazy because there isn't a big team bias. I think Ohio State was ranked number one in the initial one. Michigan, last I looked, was ranked number one, which is why it caught my eye. Uh, Undefeated. You can make a point that they have the best schedule right now, and Michigan should be ranked number one in the AP pool. Instead, they're ranked fifth. I think they've blown out almost every single opponent they've played, except for the one road game at Northwestern. And this new system has them ranked number one, but everyone's mad because it doesn't have Duke 
doesn't have Kansas ranked high, those name brands. So I, it's way too early for any computer models, but I think they should bring back the commuter, computer model for the college football playoffs. And what is your opinion on, on new computer stuff for basketball? Um, I, I, I think I would be okay with it as long as there was, there was some kind of explanation as to what, what data they were tracking or what they were looking for when they're doing it. Um, I mean, when the when they rolled the BCS out originally for football, it was to try to to take away some of the um, the guesswork of the games that you would have teams that are playing. You know, it was more conferences tied to the bowl games, but then you might have a, your number one team playing a number eight team from another conference or something that like really wouldn't match up, and so then it was tough to find a clear cut who is your number one. Where I think like with football they've kind of taken those steps in the right direction and uh you know started to get into the playoff there's still controversy over which teams are in which ones are out but i think with basketball and i don't know if that if it really has that much of an effect because when you're taking as many teams as they are for march madness within that those top 10 teams do you see do you think that there's really that much of a discrepancy as far as where you're seated at for the tourney well, that's where I was going to come at. That is going to depend on the actual application of how they use these rankings. And from my understanding, the old RPI helped with seeding. And whenever you're getting teams that are close, if you remember, I, Syracuse stands out to me as a team that was always, if you use the, like the strength of record and who they played in their opponent's record, they were always on the bubble on the outside. But people were putting them into the tournament based on uh, whatever this ranking was, now it looks like they're not even taking those brand names into account. If you're not winning, I think there's winning margin up to a certain point, and I could be wrong on that, uh, How many? who you're losing to. Um, home wins uh, don't count as much as road wins, and ho- home losses, I think, hurt more, which is where you're getting some of the neutral site games, and that's what's really knocking these teams back because a lot of the big-name teams, they all play neutral site. So even though they they win, it's not quite bumping them up as a road win. The Big Ten teams are all ranked higher because conference play has already started for them. So Michigan's been on the road at Northwestern. And these other teams, they're not. They're scheduling all cream puffs like normal. And I don't understand why the media is shocked. And I want to go another step further and say, someone runs a BCS ranking still, and people don't realize that Two-thirds of the ranking was the human pool. I think they used the coach's pool and a Harris pool, but it was still mainly people's perspective. And if they're looking at it now, UCF wouldn't be in using the same BCS that they used to use because AP poll voters and coaches poll voters, they rank them low. So you still have that people perspective. There's no way for a, a group of five team, even if they go undefeated, to play their way in. And I think that's where you really need to cut back like the basketball is doing and go to a purely computer model and put the stats there where they are. I know you can't control your, your schedule as much in football, but compared to the NFL, I, and we're going to get into it here with the Steelers, we know that there's a clear-cut path for them to make it into the playoffs. Three games left, we know what they need to do. We know who they're up against and what needs to happen. In college basketball and football, you really don't know if you're close. So I'm glad that they're trying different things, and hopefully one day we're at that same level where we can kind of talk about, all right, this is what we need to do um, for so-and-so team to make it in like we can and like we're going to do with the Steelers here in a little bit. So is there anything else you want to add on that before we move on? No, I think you pretty much hit the nail on the head. Yeah, I'm all for computers. I'm a computer guy. It's my background. So I want to bring that in. Get rid of the the bias that's out there. Just because it says Duke and they have... This doesn't take into account uh, recruiting classes either. So they don't know that Duke has these random guys that ESPN keeps putting ads on every single game about. They don't know that. They're only going to go by wins and losses. And that's what I think that's what all sports are. Look at the Heisman before we move on. Did you watch the Heisman presentation? No, because I knew it was going to be Kyler Murray. The way that he played down the stretch, and the and I think the thing that sealed 
Tua from losing it was the fact that he ended up getting injured, and it's not through his fault. And I know that the committee says, look at the entire body of work. But I think Alabama's on such a pedestal with, with where they are as a team right now that when he got injured and when Hertz came in and took over and won for, for Alabama, it showed that it's, it's cogs in a machine. And the cog broke, and they replaced it, and it wasn't a problem. And I think when you look at what Kyler Murray's done for Oklahoma, he makes Oklahoma's offense go. And I think if they don't have him and they're trying to break in a freshman or sophomore – I don't know that they have the level of success. Kyler Murray really bailed them out of some problems, and to go from Baker losing Baker Mayfield to then following with Kyler Murray and being able to have that level of success, it's it's really uncommon to go with with that level of quarterback play. Well, that's where I was going to go with this. Dare I say, system quarterback? That's what they say whenever Mike Leach plugs in uh, their quarterback this year. Was it Milshew? How do I pronounce that last name? I'm going to butcher it. Yep. Yeah. How does he plug him in and he gets no respect because he's winning at Washington State? Anybody can win at Oklahoma and anyone can win at Alabama. They've been doing it for 10 years, both schools. I don't like how they can plug in Kyler Murray. Sure, he's electric and his stats are a benefit because their defense sucks. So he gets high high stats because the defense gives up a score in 10 seconds and he's back out on the field passing for another 50 yards touchdown. So why is why is Milshu why is he penalized for having a solid defense at Washington State, something that Mike Leach isn't known for, still puts up the numbers? I just don't understand it. It's basically a social media popularity contest now. And I, I haven't watched the Heisman for years because, like you said, you know who's going to win because ESPN runs the ads for whoever they want to win the trophy. And it all shifted to Murray. Vegas shifted the odds from Tua, was it two weeks ago? I think even it might even been before the championship game. They started to shift the odds because you can kind of see where the narrative's going in the media, and they, they pick. Same with the awards. Um, it's such a, such a slap in the face to some of the players that work hard only to see big-name guys get picked. But uh, let's go on. We'll get into college football later on in the show. Let's get into the Steel City update. We'll start with the Penguins. I don't have them on the actual board themselves here, but uh, let me bring it up. The standings, getting things turned around. Got to get the line set like we talked about. Uh, beat the Islanders last night 2-1. to one. They are on uh, a decent stretch here, 6-2-2 two, and two in their last 10. They're one, two point, or wait, where's the points? They are, they're three points away now. From the wild cards, the second wild card spot, they were at the bottom of the is it divisions or conferences uh, in hockey. They were at the bottom where they weren't even going to be close to wild card, and now they're starting to climb. Get ready for that post Christmas push, and that's what we're looking for. So good, th- good things are starting to, s- to happen. Matt, you have anything you want to add on the Penguins before we move on? Yeah, Wednesday the Penguins made a trade with Ottawa. Uh, they traded Stefan Elliott and Tobias Lindenberg for Ben Sexton and McCoy and E. Cramps or Er Cramps or however the hell you say it. But uh, they traded, they got that in the trade. So I think they're starting to make that move where they're moving people around, trying to juggle things around to get try to get some things settled. So I think I'll be. I, I don't think this is the last of it. I'm sure there's going to be more to come. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. I always get confused on when we had the show and when those trades happen when they're so close like that. But you're you're right. You as a fan, you can't be upset with them uh, this year because they're making moves. This is what the third trade. It seems like the last couple weeks, three or four, that they've made. And you're right. If things aren't clicking, they're going to they're going to keep making moves. It looks like they know that that window is closing, and we talked about it last week with the expansion. You're going to have another expansion draft soon. That could be the end of the Penguins' run. In in all realistic terms, they would have to build. You'd have to decide. It'd be tough to keep both Crosby and Malkin at that point. Uh, Do they blow it up? What happens? Uh, Something's big. You're going to lose some other key points, uh, players in that system. So 
make a run this year. I'm all for it. Anything else you want to add? Nope. Not right now. All right. Pirates are also doing their, their typical moves. I saw a lot of people, and this is what bothers me with the Pirates. I saw a lot of people, uh, for some reason, a lot of fans on Twitter run their own Google spreadsheets that calculate the payroll for the Pirates. So I've seen a bunch of different people have like their post. Hey, this move saved $14 million. What, what does that even mean? Who cares? The fans aren't paying that, that money. They, uh, they traded, if you're not watching the well, video. It, it, saved, it saved the money, but they're not going to spend that money on, say, I don't know, Bryce Harper. They're We're not here. in the running for him. Here, for the people that aren't watching the video, uh, the audio only, Pirates trade Ivan Nova, right-handed pitcher, see relief pitcher, for um, a minor leaguer, Jordi Rosario, and who knows if I'm saying that right. Let me just give you some stats here. Uh, in, in Rosario's minor league career, he's pitched 162 innings, which is very similar to what uh, Nova pitched last year for the Pirates, 161 innings. In the minors, he's giving up basically – he has the same stat as Nova. There's no way uh, – Nova gave up 30, 82 runs. Uh, Rosario's given up 79 Where's the, the ERA? 3.43 for Rosario, a 4.19 for Ivan Nova. And just very, very close statistically, as a minor leaguer, that's a red flag to me. You cannot, you're not going to go, you, you should be dominating minor league players before you make the jump to the major league. If you're having guys that have very similar stats at two different levels, because where was, does this tell me where he was playing? He was playing for, oh man, of course my Major League Baseball's website uses some weird uh, acronyms. The DSL White Sox, which don't know where that is. I'll see if I can find it real quick. But he was playing for the DSL White Sox. How many steps below the majors is that? Uh it is the rookie affiliate. Like, are you kidding me? He was playing with the Dominican Summer League. So it's not even uh, single A, double A. I'm uh, very, very weary of a trade like this. And the other thing is it saved them whatever, half a million to five million. I can't remember what the number was in international money. Again, Pirates fans, stop drinking the Kool-Aid. The money should not matter to you. Who cares if we're getting some guy in the Dominican League that's putting up the same numbers oh, basically as, as our major league pitcher? I just don't understand where he's not going to use that money saved, like Matt said, to go get a Bryce Harper, to get what, Machado? I think Vegas put Machado, uh, a line on him for the Pirates. I think it was plus 1400 which is outrageous. So if you put a thousand or hundred dollars down, you would win one thousand four hundred dollars if they signed him. If you want to go make that bet, that's the line I saw, and it could even have been higher than that. It, who knows? It could have went up to four thousand. For all we know, crazy. They're not even trying at this point. Those odds could be zero. They're going to save the money. They're not going to do anything with it. Uh, there's uh, some rumors that, well, there's been rumors that Cervelli is going to be traded for the last couple weeks. Nothing has happened yet. We will see. Matt, you want to talk some baseball? I know the sure. Cardinals made some moves. How about St. Louis? Speaking of teams that that talk about, you know, spending some of that moldy money, uh, uh, trading for Paul Goldschmidt from the Arizona Diamondbacks and – you know, my favorite thing about it was after the deal, I was like, I wonder how wonder how Arizona's taking it. And immediately saw at least three people say they're no longer renewing their season tickets and how the team sucks and they're just giving everything away for nothing. And that was all I needed to know. It, that that they're getting they're getting a great guy and yeah, he's definitely gonna be a contributor immediately in the lineup for them. And the the thing that really stood out to me was that they asked um, DeWitt, Cardinals owner, about about the possibility of 
um, being in the running for Harper now that they they completed that that deal with Goldschmidt. And he said, well, possibly. He's but he said they got to look at it and see do they really want to put all their eggs in one basket. I think is the the phrase that he used. I mean, he wasn't ruling it out, but definitely looking into it and just seeing what the value of that would be and um, you know long term is it worth it? Because when you look back um, with the contract that Pujol signed with with uh, Anaheim. That was a similar deal where they put a gazillion dollars on the table and he didn't sign. It was like, well, what point do you, you know, in, in that case, I can kind of see if you're commanding, what was it, 350 million or something insane? Like, the, like when, when you're putting that much yeah. money in, you know, whether, you, whether you have a, any skin in the game or not, that's a lot of money to, to say, yeah, we're going to commit that to one player and not get anything guaranteed out of it you know you pull a hammy and you're missing you know an extended amount of time i i know my dad would be one that would be absolutely irate over signing someone to that long and that much money that then you know to quote him he'd say well they need to be out washing my car and picking up my dry cleaning and you know (laughs) cooking my meals for me if i'm paying them that much yeah i'll I'll say to your point and it's good to have a uh, non-Pirates fan on the show here because y- you're looking at it from the perspective of the Cardinals. They're in the same division. So as Pirates fans, you're looking across the division. You see the the Cubs have been spending money for the past couple of years. Outrageous, like they always do, but they're they're spending it smart. Now you have the Cardinals that are out getting guys. How are you going to compete with that? You can't tell me that the Nova deal was a great deal because it saved money. It's outrageous to even think that way. And to your point, Goldsmith, he's always ranked as one of the top. If you we mentioned fantasy football earlier, he's one of the top guys in fantasy baseball. Possibly, I want to say the top first baseman in the past couple years, or at least in that conversation, top four. He had no protection in Arizona. He put up stats, but really, what was he dealing with? Who's he driving in there? Who who's behind him that you can't pitch to him? I mean. Yep. You're getting a guy that we really don't know how how great he's going to be. He could explode. Maybe he doesn't get um, the stats he does at, at St. Louis. But I always like moves where guys come from smaller teams to the big markets. It always seems like it works out for the Yankees. But that's why on the smaller team, they're the guy. You pitch around that guy. You don't give him things to hit. If he's hitting 300 and he has no protection... What could he do with protection on a bigger lineup? So it was a it was an amazing trade. Looking at the NL Central, absolutely brutal for a team like the Pirates uh, to compete with. To be honest, if I'm being honest, it's it's just a bummer. And I think when you sign a player like that, I think it also puts into consideration a player like Bryce Harper that that wants to win a World Series. And you look at what's around. Now you just you just complete that trade. It it looks like the team is trying to win. They're trying to do something to compete right now. That that's going to attract a player like a Bryce Harper to come in. And, and I don't realistically, I'd like to see him sign, but I doubt that he will. I think he's going. He I think he's going to command a too high of a salary. And I think it's going to be too much to commit to one player. And I don't think that he'll sign there. But but. It, it definitely w- w- won't be because they're not putting a competitive offer on the table. It's not like they're going to offer them $2 million over three years and you say, well, we tried. You know, they'll put a competitive offer out there, and whether he signs is to be to be seen. And you're right. A lot of people knock, well, they're players, they're either going to sign with the Yankees or the Red Sox. It's not that they're signing with these big teams. Yeah, some of them talk about, yeah, I grew up watching the Yankees. I want to play with them. It's what Matt said. They want to win a World Series. Which team is actively trying to win a World Series? Sure, is it great you can win somewhere else? I mean, Cardinals have a great track record. They've won World Series recently. Well, you don't have to go to the big team if you don't need to. They're gonna, other teams are going to spend money. It's just what gives you the best chance to win. So, all right. Let's go from one, well, one depressing topic for me. That was a great one for you. To the Steelers, depressing all around. You want to kick this one off? Are oh, you taking a drink? The Raiders upset the Steelers. What was it? Twenty-four, twenty-one. 
What a debacle. Just top just top to bottom. It was, it was an absolute crap show. If there was ever a game, in my mind, that epitomizes what the Stillers are, it was that game. You go in, it should be a blowout game that it shouldn't have even mattered. It should have been done in the first quarter. It should have been essentially what the Titans did to Jacksonville is what the game should have been. Um, ben gets hurt. They take him out, and there's there's different rumored things as to what what really happened. There's there's part that they were they gave Ben shots, and they were allowing the medis the medication time to kick in before the painkillers to kick in before um, sending them back out. I really just think they took Oakland lightly. They saw how much of a joke that they've been, and I think that it was like, well, Ben's hurt. We're going to try to save him, and then when they realized, oh shit, we're going to lose to the Raiders. March, march Ben out there and do what Ben does, and he and you know due to some inept special teams, they almost did come back and win it. But yeah. but to me, go ahead. I was going to add on to that because uh, they they interviewed Tomlin, and he said that Ben was cleared to come back into the game, and he just seemed confused. And to me, that's like a poor head coach. Thing it almost reminds me of the the Mike McCarthy at Green Bay. We talked about it a few weeks ago before he was fired. When he said, "What was it, heads or tails?" He like flipped a was thinking he should flip a coin or whatever that decision was, and he it just seemed like you don't know what you're doing. Are you trying to win? To your point, you're probably right. He was taking them lightly. I mean, you put Dobbs in. Dobbs stat line wasn't too bad, I guess. But just be honest, he, Dobbs, Dobbs came in and you want to know what Pittsburgh's going to be like after Ben retires. That's what it's going to be. Losing to the freaking Raiders. It's going to be bad. Ben, when it, Ben came in and what? Or did he drive a touchdown that next drive? I believe so. I think he did. And um, here's a comparison. I was going to put this up as a blind test on social media, but uh, Mike McCarthy versus Mike Tomlin. Both have one Super Bowl title. Both have six division titles. Mike McCarthy has nine playoff appearances to Tomlin's eight, but McCarthy did coach one extra year. So Tomlin could tie him this year. But this is where the difference is. Mike McCarthy has been in the NFC Championship game three times at, besides that Super Bowl win. Tomlin's only been there once. So even though he's winning the division, he's not even getting close to the Super Bowl. They're losing to teams like the Jaguars in that second round. They, they're not. A lot of people say, well, they always get knocked out by the Patriots. You're losing to the team in the divisional round. You're not making it to the championship round. I don't care if the Patriots are, is knock, are knocking you out. Why aren't you opposite of them if they're always the one or two seed? Get the bye. Blowing the games to the Raiders is exactly why. You don't get there. That's why you get the poor playoff seed. That's why you get uh, the tough matchup in that second round. It happens every year. And it's, uh, and it's ironic that you bring up the New Englands because guess who they play this week? New freaking England. With with the division with the, the division on the line. Because Baltimore's back in the picture. Just when you thought they were dead, Lamar Jackson brought them back to life. I don't know what's going on with, with him being injured during their game, but you know now you have Baltimore that's back in the swing of things, and what should have been a, a, an easy fix for Pittsburgh and should have just locked the division down, now it's anyone's ballgame. Now you could potentially be entering in as a wild card team. The, this, is, this is where, to me, the issue is, is that I, th I think you look, at, you look at how bad the Browns have been. Pittsburgh should have been that much more dominant. You know, we, we joke about how bad Cleveland's been um, over the last couple of years and, and tanking and the issues with Hugh Jackson. But it's like they're starting to get their act together now with their interim coach. They're winning games. They're potentially now coming. They're, they're in the mix for the wild card hunt. A couple teams lose and they're in them. So you're looking top to bottom in the division. You're in a dogfight now. 
And because you pissed around with some of these teams that you shouldn't have lost to in the first place, you could potentially end up being on the outside looking in. Yeah, it's it's looking bad. I, I had the Raiders as what must win, and I had the Chargers the week before as almost a must win. Looking back, I, it's going to be rough because you have the Patriots, as you mentioned, Matt, and then you have the Saints. Luckily, the Bengals have been on a slide. I think they're five and eight right now. That's the final game, so I could see the Steelers somehow being what? What would they be? Seven, seven, and one going into that final game against the Bengals, winning it and sliding into the wild card spot, and then getting eliminated right away because that's that's a Tomlin thing to do. And then everyone was like, "Well, at least they were in the playoffs." And oh, Connor was hurt, or or Bell didn't sign. There will always be a built-in excuse when two weeks ago or three weeks ago now, after those two losses. Before that, they were on top of the world going into that game because I think they're on a three-game three, three game losing streak. And it's just baffling. You have well, I got a question. Go ahead. I got a question for you. And without, without letting your anger or rage weigh in, random, random stat that I, I saw today, since 2007 – Tomlin has the second best regular season record in the NFL. Is that good enough to keep his job? At 123, 65, and 1. No. And whenever I saw that, whenever you said that, I had to close my eyes because I was bracing for the worst. And you said regular season, and I immediately saw Peyton Manning eating a Papa John's pizza. That was the mental image that came to my mind. Because... That is what that record is. You already said it. You're in a division with the Browns. And let's be honest. I, I brought up Mike McCarthy because they have the Lions in their division who are equally as inept. But are are the Bears, they went through a very bad streak. They're almost like the Bengals for the Steelers. The Bengals aren't even a, a decent number two. They've been rotating with the Ravens. Ravens haven't made the playoffs in what? Seven seven years or something crazy. Like John Harbaugh's on the hot seat. And now he could be saving his his career. He could be in the playoffs this year. The Ra- if they, if they make the said playoffs, he was already done. Well, I don't think I think it was gonna be a mutual part. Remember how uh I don't think it was like if you remember yeah. the how the 49ers mutually parted with Jim Harbaugh and it wasn't really a mutual parting. I think this one was more of a mutual parting for real. Like they were trying to bring in someone that had a more modern offense is how I read it. Someone to take advantage of Lamar Jackson. But now Lamar Jackson is winning them games. So if he keeps winning to the playoffs, they're not going to... What what playoff coach mutually parts? None. He's not going to mutually part if they're in the playoffs. And who knows if they could make a run. And then there's uh, uh, Steelers fire up fire up those excuses right now. It, it's just almost crazy to me that some fans are going to point at the regular season. Great. Great, because we've been doing crossovers with what? Some of the worst divisions. Like this year, we got the Raiders. That was an automatic win before the season. They were They're awful. And now it's just like you play to the level of your competition. Great, you have that record. How many times in the regular season have you beaten New England? Can't beat them in the playoffs. Can't beat them in the regular season. Don't give me that regular season winning percentage because it's all bullshit. So, Well, that was – I mean I I saw that and then I think you you, you read stats like that and as a fan – you think, well, it's not good enough. But realistically, when you're looking at Pittsburgh right now, and, and I know one of the biggest knocks against Tomlin has always been he's won statistically more and he won his Super Bowls with Cowers guys. And that as those players that, that were the foundation of those Super Bowl teams started to fade out and Tomlin's guys have come in, they've done nothing and they've only progressively gotten worse. I, I, I know that that's been the knock, but I just wonder 
he is qualifying, like he is making the playoffs, which it, it isn't a feat to be taken lightly because there's many franchises, you know, Cleveland that, that would die to just make the playoffs year in, year out, not even take the push. So what, what is the ceiling for Pittsburgh? Are they a Super Bowl team in your eyes right now? A few weeks ago, I would have said yes, 100%. But now, I would have to say no. I don't even know if they get out. They're definitely not getting out of the division round right now. You have the same issues with defense. And now you have this kicking issue, which we didn't even mention up to this point. If you went on to to Twitter and looked at the replies that, that was it Boswell that was getting... Unbelievable. What, what did he take off the board? Seven points? Was it two field goals and an extra point? We lost by three. I think. Make one. He fell the last one. Was that the game ender where he slipped and yeah. fell? Yep. Was going to send it to overtime. Almost unbelievable that you would even, number one, be in that situation with the Raiders. And number two, not come out with a hook and ladder to get in position. To have to run a gimmicky play to, to chunk yourselves just to get into field goal range. You're right. It's just, you would think they would be laser focused on the last drive to try to get in and score. But what would the offense be without Ben? It's going to be awesome. You saw what it was. It's going to be, it's going to be able to remind you of what happened when you were dealing with the the random quarterbacks after they got rid of O'Donnell when, when Cordell tried to to be just a quarterback and go out of that slash rule. It wasn't until our boy Tommy Maddox came out of the XFL that they started to get a little bit of stability at, at quarterback. Maybe that's what we need. Maybe we need one of these minor league uh, leagues to come out so that they can get a quarterback that's already kind of shown his stuff and they don't have to worry about developing a quarterback. Because I don't know... Although- Go ahead. Speaking of developmental leagues, did you happen to see there's now another league that's p- potentially going to be coming up? Yeah, I was going to mention that. I didn't see all the details, though. I, I only I saw one thing on it, and, and I, I almost didn't even know what to say. It's like with Ricky Williams, and they were focus, like their focus is more player safety. Well, I think it was... Ricky uh, Williams, Carol- it's it's they're launching the freedom football league yeah it's like retired players or or former players or some players association league and you're right it's the freedom league or something like that and is it going to be i i I was kind of baffled if it was going to be a full league or if they were going more of the the seven on seven type route eventually where they're going for a player safety they're going to mix it up and it's going to be something totally different and to be honest, they could be looking at what's that league that Ice Cube started in basketball called like three, three league or something where it's three on three. The big baller league. Is that what it's called? Don't even tell me that's. No, 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 no. But the, this is I, I was starting to think how the NBA has multiple. Uh, it looks like they have their what G League or D League or whatever. Yeah, I think it's a G League now <laughs> for. <laughs> Well, the D was developmental league. That made the most sense. And they went to G League because I think they thought D was derogatory. Like, because people usually at, like class A, B, C, D or whatever. And they, they went with G, which I forget what that stands for now. Probably growth. Growth, like something like that. Yeah. And uh, then a bunch of retired players. I think Allen Iverson plays in that other league where it's three on three. And it's able to allow aging guys that can't get separation in a five-on-five format. It allows them to keep playing. So it would make sense to me that a seven-on-seven league would be formed by former players where they're able to get out in space a little bit more. You're not taking the hits. Like you're not getting banged in the three-on-three league. You really don't have anyone down low banging you you're, you're not going up against a seven on seven like a seven foot guy blocking your shot uh for basketball and in seven on seven it would be the same way you're not going to be getting taken out by by big defensive linemen crushing you 
if you're if you're re- on like a reconstructed leg. So I, w- I was interested in it because I want to see where it's going to go. Is it giving players a way to keep playing virtually forever? Will Tom Brady just move over there and it will be like the greatest Turkey Bowl performance Thanksgiving game where Tom Brady just standing back there picking apart people, throwing it to Jerry Rice, who's 80. (laughs) It's still in great shape. That's what it's going to be. I know it is. They saw what's happening. They saw what's going on in that other league for basketball. They're like, how's Allen Iverson still making money? Because I think they gave a million dollar prize in that basketball league. Let's look that up. I, I don't know. I just, I know we were, we were all for the extra league in the spring. But if you're going to have all of these smaller leagues, is it going to dilute the pool and lead to, to a lower quality product? And then that's kind of what my fear is, is that I, I think maybe, maybe it's a combative move by the NFL to put in all these like other leagues and can be so competitive in the spring that then it allows for there to be a better product in the NFL come fall time. Well, yeah, that's what we're really looking at uh, in the the uh, the the, the schedule is going to be the big thing in the other developmental leagues that we're looking at. The spring is great because other than spring football, you don't have any football. So you have the draft to get people pumped up for football. And then what? We go silent. If, the, if they're going to show it, they didn't show that league. So now if the XFL comes in. And they're saying, hey, we're going to put our championship on the week before your NFL draft, forcing people that are hungry for football to find it. They're going to do great in the ratings. The uh, I looked it up here. It's called the Big Three. And it says the, the NBA Developmental League was, was created to be an incubator for talent. Uh, that was changed to the G League. Which, is that, does it stand for growth? It doesn't really tell me what it says here. Um, let's see if, if it has a definition. Came up. Oh, is it because Gatorade sponsored it? you got to be kidding me. That's the worst idea. Gatorade became the title sponsor of the D-League, and it was renamed the NBA G-League. Awful. I was thinking it had some other meaning, some secret thing. But that's embarrassing. Uh, the next one, Big Three. It was created to be a rescue shelter for players the NBA took to the shed is what the the one tagline is here for the big three. And when the former NFL players get together, players like Ricky Williams, who you know still wishes he could play and be on a team, in the, in the big three, I don't think there's a coach. I think it's more like a player coach. So Allen Iverson can pick two buddies go out there and say, we're going to jo- enter this three-on-three tournament and we're going to win a million dollars this weekend. You guys want th- three uh, quarter mil or whatever? Um, I'm going to take half. I know you, guys, you each guys each get quarter mil. Maybe it's four. You could even just all four guys because I'm assuming they have a bench. Uh, I don't even know. Let's see. Who, who else played in this? Kwame Brown, Joe Smith, Steve Francis. Holy cow. Just sounds like an old NBA, NBA uh, rehabilitation league. Like it said, couldn't have said it better myself. So let's go. Let's get that. Let's get a, an NFL equivalent. Because to be honest, if NFL is going to be getting rid of hitting, how many times do we talk about bad hits? Luckily, Steelers did so bad that we're talking missed field goals and uh, poor coaching decisions instead this week. But I don't know. Anything else you want to add on that? Move on to the rest of the no. NFL? Nah, we'll move on. Um, rest of the NFL, if I'm looking at it, the, the thing that scares me is right now the Saints are in, in the number one seed. They're playing for that home field advantage against the Steelers in, what, two weeks? Because the Bears upset the the Rams. And they did it with defense. And I'll be honest, I loved watching it. It's so much better to watch a good defensive battle in the NFC. And actually the AFC too, if they're able to get some of them. It just feels like it's more football to me. 
Maybe I'm a little bit old school. And I love the, the air raid offense and the spread offense, stuff like that. But to me, those offenses are there to create wrinkles to try to make the big play. There shouldn't be a big play on every play. So as a coach, what do you think? Do you care about the style? I don't care about the style per se, but I, but I think it depends on the, the team that you're trying to build and what pieces you have available to you. So, you know, I, th- I think when you look at high school and you look at college where you're, you're potentially going to have a lot of changing parts from year to year, um, you want to make sure that you have a system in place that, that you can – you can tailor it a little bit more to to your needs. Whereas once you get to the NFL and you have a little bit of stability, I think you know they're looking for specific things that that I think makes it a little bit easier to say, well, this is what we're going to run. And, I mean, at the NFL, it just seems like a lot of teams kind of take an easier approach and just run more zone-based schemes. And that's why you'll see, um, you know, Amari Cooper had a great game for Dallas. And – there wasn't a whole lot of transition. It wasn't like he had to spend weeks to learn the playbook. He was traded and within two or three weeks was acclimated to the system, the calls, and could pick it up relatively quick because it's basically the same play, same terminology, just you know, different, different maybe code words or window dressing. Yeah, all the coaches go to the same clinics. They're all hanging out all together at the same exact camps. If we're being honest, that's exactly what happens. So, yeah, I, I guess. Yeah, they're all they're all special advisors for Nick Saban. That's what happens. That's where you go. It's coach rehab at Alabama. But I guess in the grand scheme of things, do you think the Bears can make a run to the Super Bowl this year, focused mainly on defense, as they're built? Yes. Well, I, I say yes with. Um, with an asterisk. What condition is Mitch Trubisky in? Because I think we've we've talked about it on the show before. You go as your quarterback goes, and I don't know that that they're as the offense clicks as well without Trubisky. Now, do do I think that they can potentially pull some games out? You know, they went to a Super Bowl with Rex Grossman as their quarterback. So I mean, it's it's been done. It's very difficult to do. They, I mean, they had Devin Hester running punts and kicks back, just scrambling by himself making plays. So, I mean, it is doable. But I, I think I think Nagy's a pretty good play caller. And between you know what he's doing and what McVay's doing with the Rams, it has a lot of NFL teams looking to try to find where's that next Peterson, Reed, protege that we can come in that can run this type of offense and the style of offense. Um, and that's, that's kind of the trend that you're seeing. Yeah. It's crazy because the, the bears, they could make a run to the super bowl off of another John Gruden trade shades of 2000. What was that? 2001 or 2002 when he got traded to the bucks. Now he's traded Khalil Mack. Help them solidify that pass rush, and they're dominating. It's almost unbelievable. Well, in in Gruden's defense, I, I I think when you looked at the Bears at the start of the year, did you think Chicago Bears? There's a dynasty in the making. <laughs> no, because no. I was so low on Mitch Trubisky. Right, but all along we said if you have the if you have the supporting cast around them there's potential well i i think this is one of those prime examples where and you see it where mckenzie got fired raiders gm because they rolled the dice and i think when they traded khalil mack they thought we'll trade him to chicago chicago is going to be an absolute crap storm and then even if we end up losing some games we could end up with two top 5 picks that that could really bring youth could bring stability could bring we we could change the dynamic of the franchise and then chicago goes and wins the number of games that they have and now instead of dealing with a top five top 10 draft pick you're looking at late first round so now you're you're having to move other pieces around you know 
you, you get Dallas's first round in the Amari Cooper deal, and now you have the pieces that if you need to, or you feel like you, there's a player that's high on your board, you have the pieces that you can jump back up to grab those vital pieces that you think you need. Although with the the, the last thing with the Raiders is they're they're going to screw up and they're going to they're going to win enough games to lose themselves out of the first first spot. They had that one linked up, and now they beat Pittsburgh, and they're going to go on a run. That now they're in a, they're in a tie with Arizona and I think someone else for the for the last for the first play for the first draft pick. That they're going to lose it, and then they're they're not going to be able to get you know that probably Bosa is, is who I think is going to be the first pick. If if not if it's not the Raiders, it might be Herbert. Yeah, I don't even know what to think of that. Aside for the Raiders, it's it's definitely a gamble that that didn't pay off. I'll see if I have the full league standings here if, from the NFL if they load to see who they're tied with. Um, of course, they don't have it like that on the league if you click it. But it would either be all oh, the 49ers. I should have guessed NFC West. They're awful, and that's the last thing I want to talk about in the the NFL side of things. Uh, I don't know if you have anything else after, but. Did you see the Seahawks call? I didn't complain about the refs, but they uh, the the Seahawks blocked a field goal because their nose tackle basically pulled down the center or the guard, and they had a linebacker jump over him and block the kick. They reviewed it, and then they let the block stand. Like, they reversed the call from the booth. Now, I didn't watch it live. But I believe that's what happened, and the Seahawks won. So, did you see that? No, I didn't. Because when you're winning three nothing into the fourth quarter, and the Seahawks have just been unwatchable. There have been a couple games that have been on TV that that it almost makes you just want to find something on your DVR and, and watch that instead. I, I didn't see it. They. Uh... I mean, Pete Carroll, he, he's pulling the old John Harbaugh. He was on the hot seat. Now he's falling backwards into wins, and he's going to be stuck there for another <laughs> <laughs> They're going to win. Well, they're not going to win the division, but they're going to make the wild card. I would think and so. And he's going to make the NFL safer. If I see that stupid commercial one more time with how he's making the league safer, I'm going to pummel someone. I didn't see that. What's it about? It's about their hawk tackling. Oh, I, the only one I see is uh, uh, Shaquem Griffin. Is, is that the brother with the one arm? How his dad made him do drills outside in the yard? That, that's, yeah. the one, that's the ad I've always seen. I didn't see the safer tackling. Man, maybe oh, I tackled him to eight wins, Matt. I've seen it like a thousand times where they, how they've taken an innovative approach to tackling. That, that stupid Hawk tackling videos online with like a gazillion views. Everyone that's ever coached football has watched the video. The, you, you incorporate it. I think it's almost a universal thing other than Ryan Shazier. Everyone else is using Hawk tackling. <laughs> of course, you had to go there. Although uh, Shazier, they had a video of him doing deadlifts. So he's working his way back. He went from that hobbled walk across the draft uh, stage to announce the Sealers pick to do in deadlift. So guy's a hard worker. Definitely good to see. Hopefully he's back healed and he can live a normal life. Cause I, I hate to see that from anyone form tackling or not. Uh, but I did have one other stat for you, Matt. I was looking at the NFC uh, conference. Did you know that almost every team has a chance to make the playoffs because of how bad that division is? That conference. Right now, the only teams that are mathematically uh, out are the Cardinals and the 49ers. Technically, right now, they could win three games and be tied at six wins, but I think it's mathematically impossible for a team to finish with six wins because they play against each other. So most likely, every 5-8 and eight team uh, has a chance. Now, would they would they win the tiebreaker? I don't know. But the Falcons might even have a long shot at four and nine. They would have to win their last three games to get to seven wins and hope that they get the tiebreakers based on who's there. Even the Lions have a path at five and eight. Complete. People made fun of the Northwestern winning the Big Big Ten West. 
This is even more of a shit show. It's like the most mediocre of the mediocre. And I don't know the matchups. I didn't look into it that hard. But I did see that, holy cow, one, two, three. Uh, well, the Vikings have that tie. That might be the wrench. But four teams have six wins. And then you have uh, three teams with five wins, including the New York Giants. I tell you what. Take the, take the Washington Redskins. And just let them cannonball right into the dumpster right now because it's not their just fault. Just like though. Alex Smith, just like Alex Smith's leg, they're done. They're done. Matt, you had to bring that up, and I was gonna say that was that was my final bell today. Uh, I'm wishing him him luck. His leg is infected. And in the in the article that the NFL puts out, they're talking that this infection might set him back on his timetable return to playing football. No. It might make him lose his leg. What are you guys talking about? His return to football? I think the NFL actually said, like, it, he might not be available for opening week next year. As a fan, that's the furthest thing from my mind when I see that we, we talked, was it last week we said he had the spiral fracture? Now it's infected? I'm not thinking about him making it back for opening week, NFL. I, I'm sorry. How much is being able to walk? Yeah, I want him to not lose his leg. Like, that would be horrendous. So, prayers out to him. Uh, they definitely don't want to forget that uh, we talked about it. And it seems to be getting worse each week. And it, talk about putting your head in the sand. Putting out press releases like that to the media is mind-boggling. It's almost like whenever Shazier got hurt and they kept talking about him being able to play again. Like, no, I want to see him actually walk again normal. Like, I don't want to see him grimace around the rest of his life. That's... It's uh, it's unfortunate. So yeah, that's my last for the NFL. You have anything else you want to talk about? Um, well, with the injuries and with for with the the crap show that that is the Washington Redskins now, I, I heard some complaining, like just some different things on Twitter about uh, the clamoring for Kaepernick and how how Colt McCoy is, is is a terrible option and how they should be signing Kaepernick. The only thing that I I don't know if the how this works, but with his lawsuit against the NFL for collusion, is he even allowed to sign with anyone right now because of that those charges or did he drop them? Well, I'll say this, he definitely can't entertain offers. Because if the NFL can prove that they've been giving him offers, then that automatically throws his case out, I would think. And I'm not a lawyer, That's what so I, I don't thinking. know. That's what I was thinking, too. I, I wasn't 100% sure about that. But I know for as many people that I hear that are like, oh, well, Kaepernick, it's it's all because of you know his protesting against Lake. And I think, well, if he has a lot on this collusion case, then it, it doesn't help his case to sign a contract with anyone. And I'll say off the record, off the show, I did have someone come up and ask me, about that Kaepernick deal and if he could be back. Uh, I just didn't think people would want to hear that in the mailbag. But uh, they, they were wondering about it. And to my knowledge, the NFL just has to prove that they've offered contracts or at least have had that discussion with him. And there's rumors that he self-sabotaged. That would probably be brought to light if it does get to trial. And we'll find out soon enough. Now, do they settle out of court? I don't know. I don't. I don't know what his end game is. I don't think it's to play football. I think if he wanted to play football, he could have been on the Ravens. I honestly think that. And as a as a Steelers fan, I'm kind of relieved that he's not, because we definitely don't want to face a mobile quarterback that can help transition to Lamar Jackson. They brought in RG three, didn't really work out because of his durability issues. Kaepernick didn't really have those durability issues. That would have allowed the whole offense to be built around that spread. And guess what? Steelers already have enough defensive issues without dealing with that. So I'm, I'm glad that he didn't sign just as a fan. Uh, all the other issues aside. So that's it. You want to get into college football? Yes, I do. I got a pile of train wreck stuff I got to get off my chest. Well, go ahead. Let's let's start with the ACC. We'll do our picks. We'll end them last. That'll be my final bell thing now. All right. Well, 
down in Tallahassee, still without an offensive coordinator. Walt Bell goes to to UMass, and the search is ongoing. The the one of the big names that surfaced was Hugh Freeze. Um, had his issues at Ole Miss, and there were some there were reports that well he has baggage. Well, that baggage wasn't bad enough that it didn't prevent him from signing with Liberty University. You know, a religious school was willing to take on that baggage, so it, it didn't prevent him. Um, there, there, there have been a couple other names that have been linked out with it, um, with mixed with mixed reviews. And I know, as an outsider, Rich, I want your opinion um, as you're looking at it. The, the two big names that I've heard were were Kendall Bryles, who was it. Uh, Florida Atlantic with Lane Kiffin and then spent this last season at Houston. He has his baggage dealing with all the Baylor scandals. And the other big name that's being thrown out there is Larry Fedora. Um, the hat. UNC fired, UNC's fired coach because he runs that similar style, you know, up-tempo offense. Well, I'll, I'll start with Fedora. What are your thoughts on Fedora um, is a head coach, definitely failed. I know a lot of NC State fans down here really wanted him to stay on as head coach because they they beat him more often than not. I don't know what the final count was, but he had talent. He was able to recruit talent. So as Florida State's trying to fill in for that spread, I think he might work in that regard where he's able to recruit talent. And if it doesn't work at that point, just fire him and bring someone else in. I'm always for, if you're not 100% sure, go with the guy that can recruit. And then get and then get your money and go from there. That, that's my number one idea. Now, Bryles, he's on the opposite side. He might have trouble recruiting based on his ties with the Baylor scandal. They're definitely, definitely going to be brought up. But is it enough that it would hurt? And it really comes in. Do you even want him to recruit? Because sometimes you you just have, this is going to be our offensive guy. He doesn't really even do in-homes. He's just hanging out on campus, and he, he meets with the players and goes over scheme and says, like, I'm more of a scheme guy. I'm not, I'm not a hands-on offensive coordinator. But I don't know how he handles it. Some guys are down there on the field. Some guys are just in the booth calling the plays. So that's what you have to do as a Florida State fan if you're looking at it. Are you going to go with... The guy that can recruit, which is my my preference, and and then worry about the details later, especially if your head coach is an offensive guy, you can work some of that stuff out. But I don't know. Well, what do you think in that respect? In, in in my opinion, I think Bryles is the hire, and, and what makes this situation all the more murky is the fact that at present, Florida State doesn't have an athletic director. They're still with an interim while their athletic director is transitioning to an NCAA position. And so they're without an AD, and I don't know what the hang-up is, but I, but I think that that could potentially be you know, one of the things that, that's causing this to stick or to, to hang up is, is it a financial thing that they're not getting it done? Is it that he wants to bring assistance along? And there's there's dissension between which one of his guys he can bring along with because from the recruiting end, he had won recruiter of the year honors in, in years I think maybe when he was at Baylor and X's and O's. I I have no I have a lot of confidence in in what he's bringing to the table. Um, I, I think when you see what he did the year that he was with Kiffin, um, he. He was a really big reason as to why they they almost won that conference that UCF is in. Um, they they had a really great offense. It, it was they were scoring a lot of points, and you see the drop off that they had from last year to this year with with his style of offense. I know Taggart spent time at Baylor and was talking with Browse and part of his. Gulf Coast offense, a, a chunk of it was derived from Harbaugh, but a big part of it was also the spread variations came right from Bryles. So I think that's where the connection comes in. The drawback is that people are afraid of having the the stigma of the things that happened to Baylor 
then be attached to Florida State. Well, it's not like Florida State's going in with no baggage at all because coming off of Jameis Winston and his issues, um, you know, they, they had he's had, he had several allegations and it never it never came all the way through that the things were going on um, or definitively in court that things were proved. But it's not like they have a, a sterling record to begin with. And I think for the for those people that are trying to sit on their their holier than thou throne, it's like you, you're going to throw away every decent candidate because of things in their history. We're getting to a point now where you look at anyone's record and go back far enough, you'll find plenty of skeletons in their closet. It's it's the you know what are you willing to do to to make your team better? I'll take it a step further. I don't even think as an assistant coach it matters. Look at what happens around the league. Sarkeesian fired for being drunk at team functions. Alabama snatches him up. Then you have uh, Ke- Kevin Wilson. We talked about him at Ohio State. He's fired from Indiana for player abuse. In midseason, that's how bad it was. He gets snatched up by Ohio State as their coordinator. And guess what? There's no scrutiny here. The, uh, the Tracy Clays, I know we mentioned it a while ago, he ended up at Washington State with Mike Leach as the defensive coordinator. The reason he was fired at Minnesota, I don't know if we ever brought this up because I couldn't remember where he came from exactly. He was fired because of, uh, I think it was some type of allegations of sexual abuse by players. And I don't know if he was covering it up himself or what, but they let him go. And I think it was midseason. And there was some murkiness there. He took a year off or so because no one would touch him. And then he ends up there. No one even talked about it. No one brings up the stuff like that. The bad thing is in Florida, and uh, I did want to say I don't. I think Glenn Kiffin they did win that division or their conference. They're not in the the conference with UCF, but I can't remember off the top of my head which one they are in, because when I did the the mock sixteen team playoffs that year, they would have been in. Like if they if they took conference champs, I believe they would have been in at ten and three or ten and two, or maybe yes. eleven and two. So um, they did win the conference. I, I'm 100 percent sure of that. One of the years when I did that, and um, I'm going to be sharing that closer to the playoffs. I've been looking at it, expanded playoff, what it would look like if you had conference winners and uh, the rest at large from um, the 16. Because a lot of people think that oh, you're going to be end up with a an eight and four Toledo. You're not most likely. You're going to have a double digit double digit win team like uh, FAU or someone to play in the first round, and that acts like a buy. If you're a football purist, that would basically be a buy for Alabama to play a lesser team like that. Correct. So don't put in a, an automatic buy. Because that's just more biased towards the big team. Well, don't give me that. Those SEC teams, they, they schedule FCS teams. Florida just turned down a uh, home and home with UCF because they were scheduling two FCS teams. You know, we, we talked earlier in the year with Rick about uh, strength of schedule, and there's Florida scheduling two FCS teams, and they're going to have a chance to compete with Georgia to win that side of the SEC that you're playing nobodies. It, it, it validates everything that he said earlier about about play, scheduling crap teams because Florida State arguably had the toughest non-conference and overall schedule this year and they got absolutely destroyed if they if they took you know you take out some of those non-conference games and substitute them with some FCS schools maybe it extends their their bowl streak another year but it doesn't it doesn't take away from the fact that their quality of team was what it was this year well what about you can even look at it from Michigan's perspective they don't play Notre Dame. They have one loss. And who knows if Harbaugh comes more conservative and doesn't let that game get out of hand and the loss to Ohio State's a lot closer. And then they're a one-loss team with a, a close loss. Do they get in to a playoff? Are they there in that discussion? Do they back in because they don't have two losses? They were close this year. I think they end up seventh. You take away that loss to Notre Dame – what happens to Notre Dame then? That was Notre Dame's biggest win. You take that away. Does Notre Dame even get in the playoffs at that point? So it opens a whole whole different discussion um, for teams. I'm I number one right now. I would not schedule any tough teams because all they're looking at is they, they lie and say that they're looking at tough, tough schedules, but they're not. 
Just look, when they tried to put Georgia, or they did put Georgia ahead of, did they put them ahead of Ohio State at the end? Georgia played one less power conference team. One less, I believe. I think we did the numbers. I, I, I think we talked about it on the show, but I could be wrong. Uh, a lot of the SEC teams do because they only play an eight-game schedule, and then they don't schedule another Power 5 non-conference. They just don't. Two FCS, like you said, Florida does. Now what, Florida's going to be in a New Year's Six Bowl against Michigan this year. I mean, how are they even in that game? So, it's just a it's just a a big mess. Um, what, what else do we have? The around the ACC for Coastal, Mac Brown on fire. He tried to bring in. Did you see? He tried to bring in his old assistants. It got met with so much flack because of how bad they were at Texas for being conservative back in the day. That now he's tell- doing a one eighty. He's he's not he's not conservative anymore. He he hired offensive coordinator Phil Longo from Ole Miss today. Yeah, he said he's going all air raid or all spread or whatever. He I forget what he said. Yeah, the, he's he's bringing the Big Twelve to the ACC. Well, that's and another he, that's another question we got. Uh, what do we mean by the CEO coach? And I probably butchered my explanation last last week. I think we talked about it, and it's Mac Brown. He's not going to be doing physically any coaching. His whole job is going to be make sure UNC, he does all the interviews, make sure UNC looks good. He brings in young coaches and lets them do their thing. Basically, hands off. You want an offensive guy? We're going to run this. My first, Maybe my first guy that I was going to bring in doesn't do it for the fans and they get mad. Eh, I'm not going to bring that guy in because he doesn't care. He really doesn't care what scheme they're going to run. He's just going to be up in the booth. It's like when Barry Alvarez took over those Wisconsin teams and coached him in the Rose Bowl. Like, do you really think that Barry Alvarez had a great game plan when he hasn't been in in the coach's room? No, he probably had the guys go out there. He gave a few fiery speeches, helped them study film, and said, no, this is what you need to run. Like, run this, run this, run this. And, and that was it. Let the guys do what they needed to do. So, I mean, Mac Brown... He could be very successful at UNC. He also has very underrated. He stole Tim Brewster away from Jimbo Fisher. Brewster was the tight ends coach at Florida State, went to A and M with Jimbo, and now he's and now he's at UNC. He he caught a lot of flack from. He had a short spell as a head coach and didn't do. I forget where all he was at. I think he was in Illinois. I'm looking it up right now. I think you're right, and and I don't think that it was a very good uh, I run. I could be wrong. He, he, he uh, played at Illinois, but he coached at Minnesota. I believe it was his That's right. job. And and he was and in the Big was, Ten. It, it was not a good run, but as a recruiter, and, and I believe he has a lot of connections in the, in the Houston area and in, the, in Texas, um, he pulls a lot of recruits, so I think that's going to help. UNC and they're playing on the crappy side of the they're in the coastal so bad news for Pitt fans because UNC is is definitely going to be a better team next season oh they can recruit too I mean North Carolina isn't a talentless state look at what happened how do you think App State is successful they can pull from Virginia they can pull from North Carolina and they can pull like from the Charlotte where all the areas are very large areas. Then you have the Virginia Beach area, which is a hotbed for talent. And is Virginia really doing well? I mean, they, they're running a different scheme and stuff, but in recruiting, they really don't recruit well. Virginia Tech's been on a downside since Beamer's been out. I mean, they, they, ha- they come up hot because a lot of pollsters still remember the 90s. But overall, I mean, who'd they lose to this year that was a division lower? Uh, ODU maybe you can't tell me that North Carolina can't come in there and clean up recruiting from both of those states I mean their only competition is going to be Penn State coming down so if they win and they could start out out recruiting NC State again that's the one thing that Doran's been able to do is recruit on their level and beat them but I would say North Carolina has the bigger brand just due to basketball that if they start to get things rolling they could become uh, a, a big threat in that division 
to overtaking Miami and just running it. Miami could have been running that division. Who knows what Rick is doing? And it's wide open. Pitt had the chance to come in, but they can't let Mac Brown get things rolling because he had them rolling in the late nineties, I believe, when they had Peppers. Yep. So um, that's pretty much it for the ACC. Real quick to wrap up, I don't think uh, the Big Ten was going through some more of their coaching thing. Did we talk? Did they did Maryland hire Mike Loxley before the show was over last week? I think that was the most underwhelming hire I have seen. And I say that because Dan Enos was brought in as quarterback coach to Alabama. He's now been promoted to offensive coordinator. I have a feeling that he was he was the one behind Alabama's offensive success this year. And Nick Saban kind of pushed Mike Loxley out to go get a head coaching position. And if we did talk about it, I'm not going to talk about it long because I don't want to rehash. But he was 3 and, what, 31 as a head coach. That's awful. That's what's worse than a pitcher's batting average, which is why I think we talked about it because I think I used that line. So if, if, if you're into conf- conspiracy theories, I believe Nick Saban wanted him out, even though he's a great recruiter by um, all, all everyone says about him. If you can't coach, that doesn't matter. Alabama kind of recruits itself now. Why would they need him on staff if they're bringing in this guy? Uh, they hired him away because Enos was hired at Michigan. He was at Michigan for, what, three weeks last year? He was hired, Har- Harbaugh hired him as an offensive guy, quarterback's coach, um, similar to what Peppa Hamilton does, maybe even passing game coordinator, uh, offensive coordinator. And then Saban hired him away. Why would Saban hire away a coach unless he had this planned for a while? That's my conspiracy or, theory. Go or knew it was in the works. Yeah. So, um, I, I don't know. That's all I have. Nothing really big. Oh, I was going to do our picks. Let's end with those. So we have four games. It's going to be a little teaser. On Christmas, Christmas falls on a Tuesday. So we won't really be doing a live show, but we're going to put up our video um, with our picks at the normal time, 9 p.m. So it'll be up on Facebook. Not sure if that will affect viewership or not. But uh, there are four games that will fall before that Christmas date. Uh, first one, Matt, Memphis and Wake Forest in the Birmingham Bowl. Who do you got? I got Wake Forest in that one. Just because I saw – I just was impressed with the way that Memphis gave away the game to UCF. And – Think, I think the Demon Deacons have pulled out. Wake Forest has been hot and cold. I have them as well. And I think it's it's like you said. Memphis was so close to beating UCF and playing for a meaningful bowl game. They couldn't get it done. So whenever you look at that overall, what do you see? It, it comes down to, are they going to be motivated? Next game, this is an intriguing one. Houston and Army in the Armed Forces Bowl. I actually went with Army in that one. I think, and I picked that one with my heart, knowing that Houston's OC is going to be signed away to Tallahassee, and they're going to be without their offensive coordinator, and it's going to suck, just like when Mark Rick left before the national championship game and went to god-awful Georgia and screwed the Noles out of another national championship. Go Army. I wonder if we're going to have the same picks, because I had Army as well, because of how well they did with Oklahoma. If they could contain the Oklahoma offense, what is what is Houston going to do? Plus, they beat Navy again, and Navy had a run, a string of, of wins in that rivalry, and now Army's getting getting the top. I think they ride that momentum and they get the win again. Uh, we got two more here: Buffalo and Troy in the Dollar General Bowl. Buffalo. Uh, I'll Mike McCarthy it. I was going to say Troy just because of the travel. I think Troy is in Alabama. Who knows if I'm correct. And that's basically a home game for them. That's my pick. That's why I went with that one. And the last game, I have the same exact reason in this one. It's the SoFi Hawaii Bowl between Louisiana Tech and Hawaii. Your pick? La Tech. I had Hawaii. It's at home. How it's how you know how hard it is to win on the West Coast? Look, Steelers couldn't even beat the Raiders. I could use that excuse that they had to go west. But you have to go 
multiple time zones further to Hawaii. So Hawaii at home, basically a home game, really tough to win on the West Coast in bowl games. Hawaii's, Hawaii's been down since they lost June Jones and he quit running the run and shoot. Doesn't matter. It's a home game. That's why I picked them. Uh, you got anything you got for the final bell? I already gave my Alex Smith sing, and I think we're going kind of long. So, uh, you we were, No, we went long, and hopefully hopefully the smoke will clear and Browse will be in Tallahassee, and I, I can get a good night's sleep. All right, cool. Definitely look for our college bull pick in about two weeks, but we'll be doing the next show uh, next week talking about hopefully Steelers upsetting the New England Patriots. So thanks for listening. Uh, if you got any ideas for the new format or the new video stuff, let me know, but things are clicking. We're going to get some more stuff and improve the show in the coming weeks. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, thanks again, and we'll see you next week.